my name is George. For those of you who don't know me, I see a lot of new faces, so I'm George. Uh, I'm a member of this church. I'm not the pastor. Sam is away in India. Um, we've had a lot of vacationing over the summer, so I'm filling in to speak for him uh, this week uh, in our series on the Psalms. And sorry about that. And um, this morning we're going to look at Psalm 23. So if you uh, want to turn there, and then uh, I'll pray and we'll get started. God, this is a wonderful day. Thank you for it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for bringing people here. Thank you for uniting us together. We're blessed by you. And uh, it's my prayer that you would speak to us now through your word. Um, yeah, and help us to see you always. Amen. Um, <clears throat> psalm 23 is a psalm of David. And it starts with, uh, yeah, David. Um, so who was David? David was a God follower who lived a life of part hardship and part extraordinary blessing. He was, he was chosen uh, at a young age and anointed to be king over an entire nation, Israel. He served as a distinguished member of Saul's court, the first king, uh, and lifelong friend of Jonathan, his son. Eventually, he became king and presided over the entire nation that became increasingly powerful. He had a blessed life. But his journey was a very difficult one. Saul eventually turned on him and had him expelled and hunted down to be killed. David fled for months, hiding in crags and crevices, cave, homeless. I'm sure wondering about him being chosen to be king. Would God follow through? Even after finally becoming king later on, his son Absalom tried to kill him and usurp the throne. And again, David found himself on the run. He had to flee Jerusalem, his home, and his seat of power. His life had been full of hardship and danger. And Psalm 23 is a profound reflection by David on that life that he lived, that he shares with us. So you can picture it. After that long, very difficult journey, you find yourself in David's company, warming up by a fire, conversing with the now older king of Israel. You've thought to yourself more than once, maybe, where is God? Or can I really trust him? Can I really trust him? Is he really there for me? Unafraid, you wonder out loud with David sitting there next to you. Can I trust God to guide me, to provide for me, to protect me? He looks at you with his weathered face from the long years of running and a deep gaze, and he says, yes. Yes, you can. Let me tell you what it's like. And David's psalm begins. Adoni roi, God is my shepherd. In some ways, uh, I'll read verses 1 through 3. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't lack anything. That was actually this first one. I'll read verses 2 and 3 later. Um, that's how he starts out the psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I don't lack anything. In some ways, it really makes sense that this image sticks out so much to David. After all, he'd been a shepherd for years before he was anointed king, looking after his father's flock. And shepherds really were very much a part of the culture and life and trade and time of the region, basically. People saw and observed the lives of shepherds all of the time. They were everywhere. So maybe like we see construction workers throughout the road system of Dallas. I don't know. It's kind of ubiquitous, right? You see them everywhere. You don't really think much about it, but there they are. Um, so what shepherds did and who they were resonated deeply with David and it's interesting that that image sticks with us even three millennia after this was written. 3,000 years is a long time. So David says, God is my shepherd. I don't lack anything. Older versions say, I shall not want. The idea is not that you never want anything, but that you'll never be in want, as we say. It's kind of an older expression. Lacking the necessities of life, as it were. The term lacking elsewhere, the word used here in the Hebrew Bible, describes not having enough food or water. It describes people in famine, generally the poor, and, and poor people who were poor such that they lacked even basic sustenance. It's the opposite of being well-fed, 
cared for and satisfied. David says, essentially, in this walk with God, I'm not famished. I don't lack what I need to survive. Okay, well, what do you mean, David? He elaborates in verses 2 through 3. Verse 2. In lush grassland, he puts me to pasture. He waters me in secure places. He restores my life. He leads me on the right paths as befits his name. Lush grass, abundant, safe drinking places, fruitfulness and protection. It's pretty much everything you'd need as a sheep. It reminds me of the most abundant time of year in Israel, springtime. Between May and October, there's not a drop of rain in Israel. It's dry, it's barren, the land becomes brown, parched, and desolate in most places, not everywhere. Um, by winter, the rains come, and they don't stop until around April. Uh, and so in the spring, these rocky brown hills sprout grass and flowers, and it's gorgeous. You think you're transported to another part of the world. Um, dry, river be- dry river beds that, had been, that didn't have a drop of water for months are now flowing with torrents of water, and the land just sort of becomes alive in the springtime. It's beautiful. Um, and it's gorgeous. It's plentiful for livestock. It's abundant. So with this sweeping description of plenty and provision, David sees God, his relationship with God, as a skilled shepherd leading his sheep through a bountiful land. Uh, And he needed that provision, that shepherding by God. Because sheep are, in fact, wholly dependent on shepherds for their well-being. This is in contrast to goats, Um, wild goats anyway. They're quite independent. I'll never forget when we were uh, taking a trip with Dan and Veronica Hummel, who were out of, in town visiting us. We met in Israel. Uh, we were taking a trip to, through the Negev, the southern desert in Israel, and we pulled over and surrounded by nothing but cliffs and sand and rock and 100 degree heat, there's this flock of goats, wild goats just there staring at you, with their weird eyes. Because they're like horizontal. <laughs> <laughs> with their weird eyes just staring at you. And I look back and I'm like, how on earth can you stay alive out here? Like, I, I don't see water. There's nothing for you to eat. There's nothing here. But they do. Sheep are the opposite. Sheep depend entirely on the shepherd to find pasture land, to find food, to find water. Um, shepherds provide shelter. They, they give them medication. They aid in birthing, even. Sheep are virtually helpless without a shepherd. Virtually helpless. And that's how David sees himself. If we ask David, what's it like? He's like, it's like God is my shepherd. I'm a sheep. That's who God is. And look at who is acting in these three verses. Take a look. Who's the subject of all the verbs? Or God. Thank you. Yeah. God is, except I looked down, I was like, I don't lack, but that's, that's not really an acting verb. But, um, <laughs> I was like, well. Um, God is. There's an absence of ego in the description, essentially. He is the sheep. God is the shepherd. God takes him to places of of abundance, places where he has what he needs. Um, David envisions the land that he'd lived in all his life during the springtime. He turns our gaze to the lush, rolling hills and responds to our question, can we trust God to lead us? Can we trust God to lead us? And he says, it's like this. God God takes me to places where I have everything I need, just like a sheep with good places to graze and water and a shepherd to guide it there along the way, proper paths. When I get parched from dehydration and thirst on the journey, he restores my vitality or restores my life, or some versions say restore my soul. That's, that's the image, um, actually, with that expression. Uh, the word life or soul is nefesh in Hebrew. It originally referred to the neck, or specifically the throat of a person, actually. Um, and they observed that when you, that you breathe through this thing in your neck, right? This is where your air goes. Uh, And when it's compromised, graphic image, but, you know, in battle or something, if you're crushed or worse, um, you died. You stopped breathing. The air stopped. So it came to be a figure of speech for life. You know, by metonymy, your neck represented your life. Uh, And even today, we say we stick our necks out for people. It's not quite the same, but you mean you're kind of putting yourself on the line. It's a similar image. Um, so with this image of sheep journeying from pasture land to pasture land, watering hole to watering hole, walking for miles under the heat of the sun, God, is his, God his shepherd, 
soothes his parched throat. You restore my life. You restore my vitality um, with cool water. He took care of him. And considering the hardship that David had experienced in his life, God restoring his life was not a small thing to claim at all. Now why, after all, why does God do this? Why such attentive care to his sheep, David? David says, literally, in verse 3, it's because of his name or for his name's sake. In the culture and thought of Israel, a person's name was often thought of as more than a designation. I am George. And there's really nothing else to it but George, you know? But in their mind, it also denoted something, in a sense, about a person's character. Um, so when God reveals his name, this is an example, when God reveals his name to Moses in Exodus, he does more than just say the name, right? Listen to the scene in Exodus 34. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed Yahweh. That's, that's the name. It's usually in your Bible, the Lord, but Yahweh. Yahweh, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in loyal love and faithfulness, keeping loyal love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. It's not just the name. It's this is who I am. If you think Yahweh, think this. If you think this, think Yahweh. There, it was more than a designation. It was his character, in a sense. Um, so to be God was to be gracious, merciful, abounding in love, slow to anger, etc. And here in the psalm, David identifies God's provision for him as a sheep through this long journey in these verses uh, as simply part of who he is. It's for his namesake. It's, it's, it's who God is. It's, it's what the name means. This, this, this is who God is. It's what he does. So why does God do it? It befits his name. This is God. God is, essentially. It's God being who he is towards his people and who he is toward me. He takes care of us. He provides for us. He soothes our parched throats leads us to the places we need to go. He promised to be our God and that we would be his people. That's another refrain you see throughout the Old Testament. I will be your God and you will be my people. He made this covenant with us and that's exactly what he's doing. He's providing for me just like a sheep, a shepherd, with a shepherd. It's interesting and noteworthy that the expression, he restores my life, corresponds to the opening line, I don't lack anything, uh, in these four lines of poetry. They're what's called, they're in what's called a parallel structure, uh, which is the way the poetry was wi written in the time. In, in English, we use uh, rhyming a lot. Not, not so much anymore, but it, rhyming used to be the thing that defined poetry. In Hebrew, it was parallel structure. And that means that these two lines are saying essentially the same idea in two different ways. They're two sides of the same coin, and in a sense, they're complementary. The first line, I don't lack anything, speaks together with, he restores my soul. So David isn't necessarily saying that he experiences uninterrupted abundance or that there's never hardship, but rather that God gives me the sustenance for the journey. It's not that I never get parched, but it's when I get parched, he restores my life. He brings me back to vitality. He provides for me in that sense. Because even in bountiful pasture land, sheep journey from pasture to pasture, from watering hole to watering hole. It's like when God provided food in the desert. Uh, for his people after they left Egypt. They were not surrounded by, you know, food all the time. They were not McDonald's and Sinai Peninsula. And so they had to depend on God to provide for their needs throughout that whole journey, a very long one. But he gave them what they needed when they needed it, food, water, protection, out of a rock. It's, mirac it's a miraculous example, you know? Um, and I think that's an image we can relate to, being between pasture and parched feeling like we lack, feeling like we are in need, wondering whether the next meal is coming or maybe whether the next paycheck is coming, whether when my job is coming, whether the grade is coming for those of us from school. David's conviction, and remember all that he had to go through, but his conviction was that as he journeys, God truly did provide for him, and God truly does provide for his sheep. David goes on in verse 4 to describe moments darker than thirst between pasture lands. This is verse 4. Even when I must walk in the darkest valley, I don't fear harm because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, 
reassure me, to comfort me. So our setting changes. Lush green pasture lands and restful watering places are replaced with a starkly contrasting image. Overwhelming darkness and mortal threat. The term in verse 4, often translated shadow of death, is just a combination of the words for shadow and death in Hebrew. Tzel is shadow, mavet is death, tzelmavet is this word. It's an interesting and versatile term, and it's never used with a positive connotation. Job uses it when he feels oppressive darkness, when his whole family is murdered and his farmland is burned. It describes the realm of death elsewhere in the Psalms, or in Jeremiah, a land where people neither know or obey God, killing, extorting, abusing. It also describes desert places that are just desolate, inhospitable. So the image conjured by the word here is rough, piercing, terrifying, dark. And Israel is actually full of physical places like this. Deep valleys surrounded by rock faces on either side, hidden from the sun by the immense height of the cliffs to the right and to the left. The places, places like this were dangerous. Predators such as lions or wolves, there used to be lions in Israel, <laughs> um, predators such as lions or wolves would lurk there and would steal away sheep in one fell swoop. If you've ever seen uh, you know, episodes like this on the Discovery Channel of predators getting prey, you get the idea. Uh, or for people, highwaymen would lie in wait. Uh, hiding in the rock face or a cavern and would ambush an unprotected traveler. Rob them, kill them, worse. It was a very vulnerable place to be. No one could see. There was no one there to help. It was secluded, a dark corner. So it makes a lot of sense that in a place like that you might fear evil or harm. Uh, the word usually translated evil uh, doesn't necessarily have this overly spiritualized connotation of like, in this dark cavern is evil embodied, you know, or something. Uh, but but it's, it's the idea of something bad or, or, or misfortune. Uh, for example, being ambushed by a predator, something bad happening. It's dangerous. For us, we might think of walking, you know, being mugged, walking through a bad neighborhood at 2 or 3 in the morning by ourselves. Same thing. It's like you're kind of on edge, you know. Uh, so David, so for David, facing these possibilities of danger. It makes sense that he, the helpless sheep, might fear what would happen. But as the setting changes in the psalm from lush pasture land to this terrifying plague, the subjects in the psalm change from I, the sheep, and he, the shepherd, to I, the sheep, and you, the shepherd. God became more immediate in that moment, right? He's no longer talking about a he, but a you. And the need for his presence became even more pressing in that valley. You, you are with me, says David, not he is with me. There's a switch to God's imminence, a nearness for David in those moments. And it's precisely because of God's nearness, precisely because of God's nearness, his presence with David, that he so boldly says that even in the valley of deep darkness, I'm not afraid. How on earth is that, David? Really, if you think about it. What is there not to be afraid of in a place like that, a place where you could be killed, murdered, whatever? Why is God's presence, your shepherd's presence, so comforting? Why is God being with you matter? Shepherds had to do more for their sheep than guide them to food and water. They also had to protect them from deadly predators that would try to sneak off with a sheep. Killing a bear or a lion was a struggle to the death for a shepherd, right? And a shepherd would only have his staff and a shorter club uh, tied to his belt um, to fend off any would-be predators. It's nasty business. And so when Saul doubts David's fighting abilities, uh, in the story of David and Goliath, remember, nobody wants to fight Goliath, and then David's like, I'll do it, and they're like, no, <laughs> you're like 13. <laughs> um, David retorts back to him, and he says, uh, I killed lions and bears with a staff and sometimes my bare hands. He says that, right? I can kill this godless Philistine giant, you know? 
It wasn't easy business protecting the flock. At night, the sheep were the most vulnerable. And to protect them, shepherds would literally move them from the open hill country into a cave uh, or, or some sort of enclosed place. They would herd the sheep into the enclosure and would literally lay down in front of the entrance to stop any would-be predators. If, if anything was going to come and kill the sheep or steal them away, they had to go through the shepherds. That was what they would do. It was their job. They had to protect the sheep. So how on earth could David not be afraid as he's walking through this valley of darkness, oppressive darkness? I mean, it's a powerful word. He knew that God, his shepherd, had provided for him and protected for him so far, even in the most terrifying circumstances, the most threatening of situations where he might have been killed. He was being hunted down by an army. Imagine that. But God had defended him. He remembered his shepherd, who he was, who he had been in the past. And in spite of the very real fear and very real threat of danger, he felt God's presence was real and active and reassuring. God was a shepherd, which means he not only provided for him, but he defended him. God's presence and his commitment to David superseded the danger. And remember, he knew David. Even when I walk in the darkest valley, I don't fear harm, David says, because you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. As we move on to verses 5 and 6, the metaphor changes in the psalm, but the danger remains. This is verse 5. You prepare a feast before me in plain sight of my enemies. You refresh my head with oil, my cup overflows. So we move from God is my shepherd to God is my host. Surrounded by enemies, David sees himself not as, I don't know, a mouse caught in a trap, but as the honored guest of a feast put on by God himself. Honored guest of a feast put on by God himself. He affirms in a now human metaphor, a royal feast, that God provides for him even in dire circumstances. Refreshing someone's head with oil was a standard practice for any guest in a, in a, in a home back then. Um, to, it was to see, to, their hygiene, uh, to see that their hygiene was attended to, to mask any offensive odors. Let's be honest, walking around all day in the sun and get nasty. Um, and, and to basically soothe sun-parched skin, as well as to signify generally a friendly welcome. Having been anointed with oil, David sits at the feast. And far from skimping, he finds that God fills up his cup to overflowing the feast is abundant, and his welcome is enthusiastic, sincere, heartfelt. He is God's honored guest. I don't think it's a coincidence that the only other place we find this, this expression in Hebrew, prepare a feast, in verse 5, uh, is in Psalm 78, in a description of the Israelites wandering, th wandering through the desert. I don't think it's a coincidence. This time, however, it's interesting, in Psalm 78, it's on the mocking lips of those who doubted the exact thing that David affirms in this psalm. They say, is God really able to give us food in the wilderness? That's how they use the expression. They doubted God could really do it, that he could give them sustenance for the journey as they marched through the desolate desert. David's answer to that question, can God really provide for us, is enthusiastic and is a profound image. Instead of fleeing from my enemies, I was feasting as God's honored guest on display for them to see his enemies, on display for them to see his wonder. God is with me. He is honoring me. He is protecting me, and there's nothing they could do about it. I mean, think about the kind of transcendent perspective that David affirms here. It's incredible. I just picture David having endured so much hardship and pain maybe hiding in a cave or running from Absalom or, 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 or being hunted down. And he had such faith in God's loyalty to him as his chosen king and as his son. Such a dependence on God's ability to deliver that this is his experience. Not fear, not dismay, though at times he did feel that. But rather, in that moment, he's transported in that cave hiding huddled, probably cold. He's, in that moment, he's transported to a divine reality. I may be cast off by my son Absalom who is trying to kill me. 
I may be betrayed by Saul and hunted down. But far from being cast off from God, far from being cast off from God, I am welcomed, taken care of, given a home and an enthusiastic welcome. No, he hasn't abandoned me. Even though it doesn't make sense, even though I'm scraping by to survive in his love. God's warm hearth and home are mine. His protection is mine. He smiles and fills my cup to the brim and says, Eat, David, my honored guest, my chosen king, my son, whom I love more than anything. David had seen that happen time and time again. On the run or ruling as king, God had never left him on his long journey. And so he has the confidence to end the psalm with a powerful conclusion. It's verse 6. Yes, or surely, or truly, yes, your goodness and faithfulness will chase me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the Lord's house the length of days. The verb chase is most often used in the Old Testament to describe your enemies chasing after you to kill you. That's what it's, that's what it's for. But here David, who had been chased, pursued, hunted down to be exterminated more than once in his life, says, no, do you want to know what pursues me? God's good provision and God's limitless faithfulness to me, his protection from danger, his providence, his sustenance for my very, very difficult journey. The image of being pursued is flipped on its head. It's not my enemies that pursue me. It's God's goodness that pursues me. And so the God who turns light or turns darkness into light, uh, as Isaiah says, here he turns a desperate flight from enemies into a banquet hall, a spectacle for all his enemies to see. God says, this is my son. This is my choice one. He has my love. He has my loyalty. You cannot stand against him. And that faithfulness of God Lord Chesed here again in verse 6, we talk about it a lot. That faithfulness of God gives David such confidence that he says, yes, God's good provision are here with me always. Wherever I go, as far ahead as I can see, I will be in his presence, honored at his house for length of days. It will keep going. It's like the horizon. You, you can't catch it as far ahead as I can see. That's where it's going to be. Never ending. The prophet Ezekiel condemned the leaders of Israel during his time uh, in Ezekiel 34 with the same metaphor of shepherding. It's, familiar, it's a familiar passage for some. He said that they were shepherds not leading their flocks, feeding themselves instead of their sheep, clothing themselves at the expense of the mostly, mostly helpless masses of Israelites that they were extorting and abusing. They were not good shepherds. They didn't provide for the sick. They didn't uphold the weak. They didn't see justice for the oppressed. God concludes, because of it, my sheep are scattered along the mountains. You've, you've totally screwed up. Remember, sheep are helpless. If they're just scattered on the mountains, they're going to die. Helpless sheep with no shepherd, vulnerable, alone. God's response to this is severe. And he, he tells them, I'm going to cut off the worthless shepherds. You all are going to be judged. And he says the following. Listen to this. Then I myself, I myself, will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my flock. I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a cloudy, dark day. In a good pasture, I will feed them. The mountain heights of Israel will be their pasture. There they will lie down in a lush pasture. And they will feed on rich grass on the mountains of Israel. I myself will feed my sheep and I myself will put them to pasture, declares the sovereign Lord. I will seek the lost and bring back the strays. I will bandage the injured and strengthen the sick. I will set one shepherd over them, and he will feed them. My servant David, it's long after David's dead. He will feed them and will be their shepherd. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them. 
and they are my people. And you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, are my people. And I am your God, declares the sovereign Lord. That's what God says in Ezekiel's time. And then 600 years later, after Ezekiel lived and prophesied, another prophet came in Israel, a son of David, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said the following, recorded in John 10. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's hired. He doesn't care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. The relationship between shepherds and sheep was intimate. Sheep became familiar with their shepherd, and they came to know his voice and calls very well. So if a stranger came and tried to herd the sheep away, uh, they wouldn't follow him. They didn't recognize his voice. They knew, like, you're not the guy. So Jesus relates to his followers in the same way in this passage. They know my voice. You recognize it. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. It was a profound statement at the time. So Jesus preaching um, in Israel. Many people followed him, but many did not. And he was like, if you want to know who my flock is, take a look at these people who are following me, listening to me, obeying me. This is my flock. They hear my voice, right? Those are his sheep. And he, as the good shepherd, lays down his life for his sheep. Like the shepherds of his time who put their very body between wolves and lions or thieves who would steal the sheep. Jesus put his body between you and death itself. And death itself when he died on the cross. And now risen by God's power. Jesus has not abandoned us, his sheep. He shepherds you. Any one of you who would answer to Jesus and say, yes, I'll follow you. He shepherds you. He shepherds you in those times of an abundance and through those valleys of unspeakable pain or overwhelming darkness. The image of a shepherd ultimately is not a dignified one. It's comparable to how many we might see a garbage man today. Shepherds were a necessary part of life, but they were dirty and often poor and lived hard lives. The image of a shepherd is not a dignified one, but it is a passionate one. And it is what God saw fit to be called in his relationship with us. Through plenty, through fear, through suffering, he says, I am the good shepherd. I am with you, even though you don't always understand. I'll lay on the dirt in front of a cave in the middle of the night to protect you. When deadly animals or thieves came, shepherds who were just hired would run away. The sheep weren't worth risking their lives for. But Jesus says, I'm not the hired man. I won't abandon you like they would. You are mine. You belong to me. And I treasure you. I died for you, and I would again. David, through all his trials, being betrayed, his mistakes, his complete moral failures, his running, living homeless in caves, being hunted down, ascending to the throne of Israel, only to be ousted again. Even through all that, he sits down and looks you in the eye as you ask, will God truly provide for me? Will God truly provide for me? And he says with complete confidence, God is my shepherd. I don't lack anything. In lush grasslands, he puts me in pastures. He waters me in secure places. He restores my life. He leads me on the right path, as befits his name. Even when I must walk in the darkest valley, I don't fear harm. Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a feast before me in plain sight of my enemies. You refresh my head with oil. My cup overflows. Yes, your goodness and faithfulness will chase me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the Lord's house, house for length 